And one of the reasons why I keep doing this is that I really love it that there's a whole bunch of people doing this stuff that doesn't really need to be done. I mean, it does. <laughs> In the grand scheme of things, planting a field of wheat or raising a cow might be more important. <laughs> but, but we find such um, fulfilment and such connection and uh, such wonderful relationships through it. Welcome to Cycling Demystified, brought to you by Foundation Bike Fit and Frequency Cycle Works, the podcast where we help you take your cycling to the next level by sharing the knowledge from experienced bike fitters, mechanics, and the hidden players within the bike industry. This week, Wei takes a philosophical wander with Gillian Cork, a mother, teacher, educator, musician, and channel swimmer. Whilst the craft of bike fitting usually starts with biomechanics, great bike fit results are rarely achieved without creating, understanding and navigating a meaningful connection with the rider. Gillian teaches these essential relational skills so that fitters can fulfill their potential. Listen on if you're a fitter or rider who wants to understand how the key to great performance may be hidden in your capacity for self-awareness. All right, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, welcome back to the Cycling Demystified podcast. Um, I think we've changed our name since uh, last time we had you on, Gillian, but <laughs> we were soft issues, now we're Cycling Demystified. So welcome back to the new podcast, Cycling Demystified. Gillian Cork, welcome. Thank you. Hi, Wei. Yeah. Good to see you Yeah, again. And um, for those listeners who haven't listened to our previous podcast, which they should go and listen to, uh, I'll put a link in the show notes. But uh, tell the listeners who you are, um, what you do, and yeah, why they're listening to you. Okay. So my name's Gillian Cork. I am half of Talk Cycling. I'm the background half. Um, Talk Cycling is a bike fit education business based in the UK uh, with Tony Cork doing the bike fit training. Um, I do the client interaction and um kind of what you would call soft skills training for it um why am i here today i'm here today for the love of way <laughs> <laughs> oh thanks um but also with um to share your knowledge because there's uh, there's lots of gold within that brain of yours uh, yes and absolutely. uh and yeah, one half of talk cycling, but I would say, yeah, the, the hidden skills, which I think separate maybe, um, I don't know, practitioners who kind of work in a different kind of way, I guess. Um, and maybe, um, I don't know, not putting it very well, but um, I, I feel these kind of soft skills, I feel soft skills is not not the right kind of word for it. <laughs> but, Thank you. Uh, yeah, they're, they're such important skills which improve um, the results that we get with our clients, but also the relationships that we form with our clients. Mm. Um, and maybe you can talk about where the, the kind of the bike fit world kind of meshes with the other worlds that you kind of work in as well. Yeah. Because um, you didn't start out just working with bike fitters, did you? No, I didn't. I've got a long history in community sport um, events I was a music teacher for a long time um, when we w lived in Tacoma in America I did the kind of community work around the shop making the newsletter um, putting on events getting people engaged in the cycling community who might not necessarily be cyclists and um, I started watching bike fitting gosh about the same time you started the reckon wave not yeah. <laughs> with Tony doing it but coming from um coming from an instrumental music teacher background so lots of one-to-one -one interactions lots of group interactions and um again one of the sort of crossover points is that those the reason people are doing what they're doing is because they want to achieve something and they want to develop themselves in some way so if you're a cyclist who's going for a bike fit you're probably going to make something better or improve something or fix something hmm. so that you can whatever and if you're a music if you're playing an instrument then you're going to your lesson to learn something to be able to do something else so they're quite hmm. um they're quite similar personal skin skill sets um hmm. but what i notice in both fields is that the technicalities and the skills and the data gets pushed in front of the relationship between the 
the bike fitter or the teacher and their client. And that um, is the kind of foundation for what the success of whatever it is the person wants to do will be ultimately. So rather mm. than being called soft skills, which is what it gets put in the business world, it should actually be starting skills, essential skills, I think. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the the thing that you quickly discover as a bike fitter who has to spend two hours, three hours, four hours with a client or with a rider. You are required <laughs> to accumulate some of these skills in order to have a relationship, to, in order to be able to go through the process of you know figuring out what is best for the rider in front of you. And it's, it's very easy to kind of rely on, I guess, hard skills. <laughs> I don't know, hardware. <laughs> yeah, hardware. <laughs> hardware, um, you know, to kind of lead the, um, the session in terms of, you know, this is what's happening to this body in front of you. But it never tells you anything about kind of what a person is feeling or kind of what their ambitions are, what their dreams are, what, what do they really want? Like, you know, as you were saying, you know, you're learning an instrument to get to, you know, a certain point. Mm -hmm. Um, and so your, your, your hardware is not going to be able to communicate that to you. So you need, you need that human relationship to be able to figure out the, the really, the, the really important points, the, the, the dreams, the desires, the, the ultimate goals mm. in order to make this practice, um, this bicycle, which you're sitting on, take you there. And yeah, I think you've, uh, you're now kind of integrating these, um, these skills and skill sets and relationship uh, tools into uh, the bike fit education. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So I um, sort of brand myself as contact point because you and your client are the fourth contact point. Nice. Um, but I then offer that within the talk cycling education. So, for example, we just had a two-week summer school here in Bath, and the day six of the summer school was a whole day focusing on interpersonal relationships. Um, and within that always comes out the... Um, that the in the often the barrier between what the bike fitter wants to achieve and what the client wants to achieve is actually within the bike fitter and once they get rid of that barrier the client is then free to do whatever it was that they needed to do so we very very lovingly and very very gently work with um the work with the goals and the desires and the strengths of the bike fitters who are there and then we do some uh targeted and focused activities to let them get whatever learning it is that they personally need out of it and um, we do that within a group setting so you've got that um, empathetic witness you've got that contribution toward the group and you've got that feeling of oh I'm not alone in this wow okay it's not so difficult now let's go forward together and uh, it creates really beautiful learning environments and quite often um, surprises for the people who take part as well um, which is really beautiful to be able to facilitate and to um to witness for them there was there was a guy who did the course this year who was basically an expert in what i was doing and delivered courses for it around the world mm. and yet he shared this is the first time i've actually really been able to think about myself with any of this mm. Mm. yeah i guess that's um certainly when i came and did training with you as well um yeah, as a as a bike fitter, you, or as certainly as a practitioner, and I'm sure this is the same for a lot of health practitioners. You spend so much time giving to other people, and you're always trying to help other people. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to kind of look within yourself and figure yourself out. It's, uh, if you don't know yourself, then it's really difficult to be able to kind of help other people in a in a, in a roundabout way. So it's a funny kind of circular conversation that kind of goes around. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I just want everyone to know that anything that I get anyone else to do or think about, I've already gone round about four times myself so that I can get it to <laughs> yeah. to, for other people to be able to go, oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's all right. <laughs> the other side, yeah. is it's all right on the other side. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, the um, it's, it's probably one of the most difficult kind of parts of the education course that you can go through because it is pretty... Um, 
I guess, uh, yeah, you have to kind of be willing to confront yourself and, you know, all those uh, learned, um, I always say learned movement patterns because I'm just stuck in bike fitting. I was yeah. stuck in biomechanics, but yeah, um, I guess learned thought patterns yeah. that you have uh, within yourself. And uh, yeah, just, just like your own movement and body, like your, your mind is kind of stuck in certain ways and so on. So just getting giving you that flexibility in your mind, I guess, to think in different ways. Yeah, definitely. Would that be fair? Yeah, definitely. And there's so much talk in, um, in education, in training, in the cycling world about resilience, about flexibility. And there's like a, there's a sort of cultural um, back, backstory of the idea of resilience being how much stuff can you put up with, mm. uh, which creates a rigid structure, when actually mm. resilience is being able to bounce back from something. Mm. And it's being yeah. able to absorb, think about it, and come out again. Mm. And so uh, there's some, you end up with sort of wider, wider cultural beliefs coming in as well, where people start going, oh, well, where I grew up, we used to do this. Oh, well, I, where I grew up, you couldn't go out riding at night because whatever. Oh, is that why I don't like doing training at six o'clock? Mm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't know, there, there's certainly some uh, like kind of hard embedded uh, culture, culture within cycling, especially around resistance or uh, resilience. And um, I think a lot of people put that or like to use the word suffering yes. in that. <laughs> and <laughs> certainly a, a buzzword within the, the endurance community of, you know, how much can you can you suffer? How much can you put up with? and you know, is is that actually, you know, a a useful useful term? Is it um, is it a healthy term? Mm. Is it, you know, a badge of honor that you know maybe for the short term it um, helps you get to a certain goal? But you know, is that something a, a badge of honor you want to keep keep wearing? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, definitely. There's like there's two there's, there's two types of suffering, isn't there? One of them's ignoble suffering, and I can't remember the name for the other one. But one is the kind of suffering where you know you're keeping going for a purpose and the other one is where you're just basically beating yourself on the back because <laughs> to see how much you can put up with. And unfortunately, yeah. I used to do long distance swimming. My dream when I was a child mm. was to swim the channel. Oh, wow. And I did actually swim the distance of the channel in a week when I was about 10. Whoa. So <laughs> when you talk about long term stuff and long distance stuff, like for some reason I did that when I was a child. And... Uh, I so I totally get the you know how, can I keep going can I prove myself uh it's just a little bit more just a little bit more um but it's been able to come up for air and breathe and look around and see what else is being impacted by those choices and decisions that you're making right then I just had a, a remembrance of an activity going back to that the client and the bike fitter and talking about these long-term goals and um uh beliefs and things there's a lovely activity that you can do where you get a jar and you've got rocks and pebbles and sand. And what we tend to do in life is fill our jar up with the sand. Mm. And there's no room to put the rocks and the pebbles in. But actually, the rocks are our core values. The mm. Things that are the most important to us. So for, for me, some of my core values are family time, um, time in nature and integrity. So if I was going to do this activity myself, I'd pour out all the sand of scrolling on Instagram and um, <laughs> doing stuff for other people. And I'd get my rocks and go, these are my rocks. These are really important to me. And that's OK. I'm going to put my rocks in my jar. There goes integrity. There goes time in nature. There goes time with my family. And now I'm going to get my pebbles. So my pebbles would be, for example, um, uh, being practical, getting stuff done on time. Um uh trying to eat a balanced diet i really struggle with that <laughs> balanced diet. um what else might go in having fun things so then i fill it up with pebbles and then there's some room left for the sand so then i pour the sand on an extra glass of wine a bit longer out at the, at the swimming pool so a bit more time on instagram mm. and then that's where you've got your balanced um life that is representative of what is really truly meaningful for you mm. um now, what if that's my jar, that's full of my jar, my client might come in and their values might be completely and utterly different to mine. Mm. 
and so somehow we've got to come to a point where we're speaking the same language me as the facilitator needs to understand their goals and their values to be able to help them with their goal because it's their it's their thing not mine when they come in um and that i think is one of the fundamental differences is between talk cycling education and things where you might be selling a product or you might be putting forward a particular system is this um you would call it person-centered um if it was an education you might call it child-centered approach where you really are facilitating the the goals and the dreams of the client who comes in what, yeah your rocks be? <laughs> my rocks um i don't know there's uh, there's so many <laughs> but yeah probably pretty similar um uh, now with a young family then family time has suddenly become you know a, a critical kind of rock um being but just having time for each of us individually as well um like i know my wife needs time i know i need time i know my daughter needs time um so just respecting those kind of boundaries mm -hmm. as well um getting outside i guess that's similar to being in nature just like if I sit inside all day long, it's definitely not so good. Um, and uh, I think sharing um, experiences, like, uh, yeah, I think with my daughter, for sure. Like she, she always wants to know what's, what's happened, what's, what's going on, what's important, what's uh, happening in our lives. So yeah, just that kind of sharing um, of experiences. So, um, I don't know. I think I think the the main thing is for people to think about, you know, what what are your values? What are those kind of core values? And yeah, what really does matter? You know, what what becomes the rock? Are you are you looking at a rock or are you holding on to sand? Yeah. Um, actually, that's just made me think of um, is it Maslow's Maslow's um, pyramid of um, of needs. Yeah. Um, Again, if people don't know that, go go look it up. I'll, I'll leave a link in the show notes. Um, but it's a pyramid of kind of basic human needs. Um, at the bottom, there's the essentials like uh, sleep, food, um, shelter, mm. things like that. And then on top of that, then there's um, kind of exercise and um, uh, um, I kind of love and and so on and 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 so it kind of stacks up until you get to the very top which is i think um i don't know uh what your value what your philosophy is on on life and things like that yeah and but without the the bottom half of the pyramid you can't kind of build on top um but i think it's quite easy to get it upside down <laughs> to have all the <laughs> the kind of stuff at the right at the top of the pyramid like uh, i don't know certainly in bike fitting terms we everyone's chasing kind of like aero this and aero that and you know my power meter i do I, I need to have my power meter i need to have my aero socks i need to have like my i don't know cables hidden inside my bike and so on without actually well you need to start at the bottom of the pyramid which is you know well it's the same as the basics of life are you sleeping well are you eating well are you performing well as a human being and then do you have your by position right are you able to function well uh and then once you've got the basics in place then you can kind of build that build the relevance and uh build the relevance of all the nice things at the at the very pointy mm. end of the of the pyramid mm. so we always want the top of the pyramid we always want the shiny kind of peak uh and sometimes we forget about the the stuff underneath yeah um so I guess in in many ways you're you're building the the, the psychological kind of needs, the relationship needs that uh, are required to create these kind of strong relationships and um, and great results in terms of you know we're talking about athletes and people who want to perform well in their in their sport. Yeah, absolutely. And those oh, we could get into all sorts of philosophical conversations around this, but those. Um, when you're working with something that is really visual and that is really kind of you know you've succeeded when you've won um you can get tricked into thinking that that is the the um that is the thing to aim for but actually it's the outcome of all of the rest of it mm. and if you do all of the rest of it that will happen naturally 
Mm. You keep it in mind. There's a this thing where you start start with your finishing point in mind and then move backwards. Yeah. But if that finishing point is floating in thin air with nothing underneath it, you know, it's a it's a um unrealistic thing. It's just making me think of um some friends we friends and colleagues we've got in the Philippines uh who get people coming to them wanting the cables inside, the shiniest shoes, the fastest socks and all the rest of it and they've never actually ridden a bike before <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> and they just want they want to look the part um a bit like when people used to go to the golf the golf course um yeah. back in the 80s and 90s i don't know if that still happens but you know i want to look the part have the stuff and uh pedal around a bit because this is what we do here now yeah um and you were just saying the lifespan of a triathlete is two years did you say yeah yeah there's um yeah a recent study i'll have to dig it out somewhere but um yeah it's kind of crazy that um you know from getting into the sport and going out of it the i think 80 percent of triathletes are kind of done within two years and yeah it's kind of a shocking statistic in terms of you know longevity in the sport and you know why people are getting into the sport is are there other goals kind of unrealistic or is there something about the sport itself which is really not kind of helping longevity and participation is there something culturally which just doesn't quite fit um and we were having this conversation in the studio um recently about people that like the, the most difficult athletes to kind of work with almost is are those who are the the one timers the one people the people that just want to do the one event and that's it mm. it's it's like a bucket list tick box you know exercise of like i don't know why but i just want to do an ironman and that's it and maybe that's okay but you it's really difficult to find a, a real kind of purpose or meaning within that kind of one time mm. event because you never master your your practice yeah you you know you, you're about to spend all this time and effort and energy and finance on on this one goal without really understanding why why you're doing it or kind of appreciating the um the practice of it mm. and you know being being within a a sport that requires continual kind of um work yeah you know that's that's kind of real that's kind of well certainly for, for for my own sake or my own ideas this is kind of where the value is in kind of what we do um you know we, we've both been in <laughs> cycling for a long time and you know it, it's, i'm always learning stuff there's there's more stuff to learn yeah. but you kind of you have to build on that kind of long-term base to to get to where you are yeah. Um, uh, what were you say? What was that phrase you used? Uh, I wouldn't be where I am today without. Is that something you kind of brought up in the earlier conversation? Yeah. As something you brought up in the summer school. Yeah, I wouldn't be where I am today without dot dot dot. And uh, it in my head that sounds there's a character in an eighties TV program who's complaining basically, and they're feeling undervalued, and they're feeling like they're thinking that no one notices them and they start ranting with, I wouldn't be where I am today without. <laughs> and uh, that's actually, I think that's actually a really lovely thing to do is just to take stock and look back and just think, what have I done to get me to this point today? Um, I had the occasion to go through my CV a couple of months ago that I hadn't done for years. And I was like, oh my gosh, I literally wouldn't be where I am today doing what I'm doing without that lifeguard job that I had when I was 16, where yeah. I sat watching people in a community swimming pool for five years, working through all the different leisure centers, or, you know, I mean, all the stuff that goes on with, with that. Um, and I taught myself to touch type whilst I was working at reception. And I earned enough money to pay for the birth of my first child when we lived in America. So there were some material things, but I also got five years of enforced watching. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was like, wow, I could, literally couldn't do what I do today if I hadn't had that. 
but that wasn't in my mind when I was 16. I just wanted a job that paid more than minimum wage that required very little effort. And uh, I liked swimming. As I said, I swam the channel. Um, I didn't. I like to tell myself that. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, just taking stock to kind of re... Part of me really likes the idea of reclaiming. Part of me wants to vomit when people say that sort of stuff. But reclaiming the idea of taking stock and looking back and uh, just really valuing and showing gratitude for all the all of the things all of the people all of the places um Mm. and we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you and tony meeting in condor in 2005 or something i don't know ridiculous (laughs) yeah And, and i think that's what we kind of want people to uh kind of hold on to especially um when you get caught up in the the here and now and the the immediacy of you know an event's coming up and like oh my god I feel totally unprepared and mm-hmm. everyone feels unprepared for what they're about to do and it's easy to just uh, panic a little bit mm-hmm. I guess mm-hmm. and have a bit of a knee jerk reaction and feel you got to throw everything at this one event or race or time. It means everything, but yeah, you know, there's, there's always another race. There's always another time, yeah, right. unless Good you're mindset. a professional athlete. You know. Yeah. That learning, that growth mindset, that kind of, what, what were the attitudes to mistakes in your household when you were growing up? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's, <laughs> it's, I mean, that, that's a difficult one. Again, I guess that goes back to confronting, you know, what, what all those subconscious um, experiences that you had and how that informs you as a, as a person, you know, and the decisions that you make. And that's the tricky bit where you come in, where you have to pick apart those uh, little subconscious uh, experiences that are literally informing everything that you do right now. Um, and that we don't realize because it's subconscious that it's happening. It just, it just kind of happens. Yeah. Um, and just having the realization that, you know, what you do like now is, I don't know, automatic in many ways. Yeah. It is, but, that's one of my favorite activities to do is just to get people to stop and uh, sit down and just breathe. We had, without going into the let's become conscious of our breathing. Um, I grew up in the northeast. You didn't do stuff like that there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but sit and breathe and just think, what of me is moving without me thinking about it right now? Mm. And what is, um, what are these unconscious things that are going on? And then you draw your attention to them. You go, oh, look at that. Isn't that interesting? My my right hand's going like this right now, and I had no idea. Mm. Or um my I don't know for me under my ribs just suddenly started squeezing so I'm getting a bit nervous thinking about this sort of stuff Mm. um and then once you we we say trust the process but once you start to become conscious of these tiny little things just like oh it's happening okay didn't Mm. know it was but it is uh then that kind of opens the door to becoming more aware of other things that are going on for you like for example you've got someone coming in who says they're going to do an Ironman in six months and they've never swum before, and they like running. People think I might be joking. I'm not. Stuff like this happens. I'm going to do an Ironman in six months. I've never swum before. People like running. I like <laughs> running, and I've got this bike that my friend gave me. Yeah. <laughs> so you come in, and so you could either go, oh, no, here's another one. Or you could go, uh, this person's insane. Or you could go, um, right, let's see how they get on. <laughs> And how, depending on how you one approaches it as the bike fitter, the outcome for the client is going to be very, very different. Um, we had one of these in the in the summer school. A very experienced physiotherapist suddenly realised the impact that her intention and um, perception of the client had on the long term outcomes for them. Mm. Yeah, it's. Um... It's really difficult to, I don't know if you can ever be completely objective about it, um, but maybe that's not the point. It's, uh, you know, as a, as a practitioner, 
you are there to to help people yeah. and to put put their needs ahead um but you yeah you need to have the headspace for you to be able to kind of do that to to be open as well to challenge your own um kind of ideas around what is i don't know air quotes right <laughs> yeah um, and whether i need to be right and i, I just want to yeah. magnify what you just said there maybe that's not the point the point is not mm. to be open to everything and accept everyone and everything's all right mm. the point is to recognize what's going on for yourself mm. and accept it and then do something about it within the environment so if you're working in a busy bike fit studio and you've got five clients coming in through the day guaranteed one of them is going to wind you up so the point is to be with yourself and go i get really wound up by this kind of client what can i do for myself to be in a place where they can do their thing hmm. yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's my day <laughs> yeah. um yeah and it does come up like um matt and i in the studio talk quite a bit about you know um social battery yeah, like he, yeah. he always wants like you know I, I want that social battery badge you know with the slider that says you know how much battery i've got left to <laughs> kind of deal with you know what's um what situation people bring in yeah. and so on and you know sometimes yeah there's there's less social battery and so you know um bike fits are kind of I don't know. They're not so exploratory. They're kind mm. of a little bit more, you know, uh, monotone or whatever it is. But yeah, um, at the same time, you know, clients kind of bring their own their own batteries in, mm. and <laughs> and yeah, it's an interesting time when you have two people kind of bringing two different ideas and seeing kind of what happens. And I guess th so that that's the skill. Yeah. How do you, you have I'm to curious then, how do you and Matt navigate that? Let's say um, one of you had something big on the night before and you come in tired and the other one's done three fits and there's still another three to go. How do you guys work between you to navigate the scheduling? And let's say someone comes in who has a bigger thing to work on than you thought. Sure. I think um, <laughs> I think we've been working together long enough that we kind of read each other quite well. Um, it, it's kind of scary <laughs> sometimes. You're like, oh, I spent a lot of time with this person. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, there there is a recognition because because we go through the same kind of processes and we know what it feels like when something is challenging or even what we'll be doing is one of us will be working on a fit and the other one will be kind of working on the admin in the background. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we'll just know that or li just listening to the conversations and so on, you'll know that someone is struggling or someone needs another perspective or someone just needs a little bit of reassurance that, yeah, this is kind of, this is right. And I, I guess um, we're in a, um, a situation which is not so common. I guess uh, bike fitters normally work alone most of the time. But if there's two of you there, there's, it does change the, the situation and having that kind of reassurance that someone's got your back, I guess, mm. and um, can can just kind of uh, jump in with a, a little comment here and there or, or just have a, a bit of time out and a bit of discussion. Like, yeah, okay, do you see what I see? Do you feel what I feel? Um, does that make sense? Does it not make sense? Mm -hmm. And it's just, uh, yeah, just checking in. So sometimes, yeah, you get lost in your own head. <laughs> so you just need someone else. Um, and I guess that, that's like bike fit, isn't it? Like most people are trying to figure out their own bike positions and and bodies and so on. And sometimes you get to a point where you're just like, I just need someone else to tell me good, bad, ugly, mm. whatever. Yeah, I can sense check. I just can you put like um, can you put surveys or questions on your podcast links? I just thought that uh, yeah. would be a really yeah, interesting, yeah. like, wider industry question. Do you have a work partner or um, do, would you like, do you like working alone or do you like work with other, working with other mm. people? Mm. Or um, how, if you are working on your own, do you have support within the situation that you are to get that sense check, to get that space? And if you don't, would you like it or how will you get it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is why 
I was really keen to like kind of build a, a team around uh, in the studio and so on. And we've got a mechanic, mechanic Ev, who works in the same space as well. And it's always nice having him in the background, just kind of fettling away, doing his things, talking to the bikes. <laughs> um, uh, but he he has a completely different perspective again. And sometimes he'll jump in with like, you know, a question or, you know, a comment. And it's just something we haven't thought about because we're, we're bike fitters yeah. and that, and you know, that additional perspective is always valuable, you know, just in terms of either questioning, you know, what you're doing or, uh, validating kind of what you're doing, things like that. So, you know, it's, it's really difficult. Um, I think we all want to do it on our own, but really teamwork does make the dream work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, you, you do you do need other people to kind of uh, get you up the pyramid, as it were. Yeah, definitely. And together, this is when you were talking about Manslow there. He actually got it from um, from I can't remember. Oh, sorry to the people, I can't remember who. But an an indigenous tribe in America. He didn't make it up. He went mm. and lived lived with these people and was like, "Oh, this is we'll learn from you. This is what's going on." And then formed mm. this hierarchy of needs, and it's actually been revised a couple of times over the last few months and that um when you want to move from an egocentric way of working into a collaborative collective way of working that valuing each perspective as equally important is one of the ways that that teamwork does make the dream work and unfortunately not all of us have had the experience of a team that was a dream we've had the experience of five egos all trying to make themselves or whatever it is that they're doing the most important and that's when you get kind of unsettling workplaces mm. and unsettling um unsettling um outcomes which then leads people to wanting to work on their own mm, yeah and i guess like one of the interesting things that comes out of our fits is trying to get people to trust themselves mm. as well like riders to trust themselves and that they essentially are an expert on their own body and you know i n- no one can tell them whether or not a saddle is comfortable, <laughs> they they need to tell themselves, or they their body knows whether or not uh, a saddle is comfortable or not. And that is interesting how often you need reassurance. You need like you need to be able to trust, or someone just to say, yeah, it's a you know your body your body does know, um, or just connect um, with your body again, again like you were you know just sitting and breathing and feeling you know what is my breath doing, what is my bum doing yeah. <laughs> what, is, yeah, you know, so what am I feeling then that I, putting the saddles in there that takes us back to the suffering again mm. well uh, I try and talk about women's bits as much as I can on anything I get to talk mm. about <laughs> because <laughs> people will have been women have been told for a long time to ignore their bodies and mm. to ignore their bodies within a situation and unfortunately there's a very um soft part of your body coming in contact with a very hard part of your body for a very long time mm. And if you sit on a saddle and you go, oh, yes, it's fine, but it's really not fine, that fine for two minutes in the bike studio is going to turn into agony four hours Mm. later. Mm. And um, when you've heard of people having surgery on their lady bits in order to not Mm. be able to feel something because they made themselves go too far, then it's like, come on, people, it's time to to start paying attention now. Um, So, but also like, being able to say to another person actually it's really uncomfortable um mm. you know I, I rode on a boris bike for half an hour around london i, I couldn't wee properly for the next day because it hurts yeah. so much <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it's kind of crazy how much um the, the interesting thing that often happens in bike fits and and often why why it takes so long is because it just it does take time Mm. to form the relationship to trust someone to feel like you can talk about all the things that you need to talk about and you know it'll often be at the beginning of the session you'll be you'll go through the the usual prefit questionnaires and you know so have you had any injuries any illnesses anything kind of any accidents any um discomforts and things like that and then two hours into a bike fit be like oh by the way i broke my neck or like, I, I fractured my pelvis or uh <laughs> i've had surgery <laughs> and it's like oh, i've forgotten about it or like often it's it's kind of buried mm. it's, it's been 
kind of put to one side because it was a, a traumatic experience and like the, the mind doesn't want to think about it mm. but suddenly it becomes relevant like oh yeah I can't turn my neck 90 degrees on the right hand side mm. but I can on my left oh why might that be oh yeah I broke my neck <laughs> in uh, 2014 or whatever it was You're like, oh right <laughs> there you go that might have uh, something to do with it um and so yeah it's it, it's uh yeah t- again going back to time and having time to process and go through like four hours in in a bike fit you know that seems like a long time to to be with a person and to do a bike fit and so on but it's it's a very short time in the kind of overall picture of mm you know, an athlete's life cycle, especially with cyclists, you know, how much time are you going to spend on your bike? How long are you going to spend riding and pushing the pedals? And how many thousands of pedal revolutions are you going to do after, you know, a bike fit or before a bike fit and so on? And, you know, that concept of time and how you spend your time, um, I don't know, it's a a difficult one to kind of get across in uh, in a short period of time. Mm but um i don't know if you kind of come across similar kind of issues with the the kind of bike fitters you train or um the yeah it's interesting people that go through the summer school people so we're in a very very fortunate position and a very interesting position to have people come to us from literally all over the world and so we get um very different cultural backgrounds, very different professional backgrounds and very different current current working environment backgrounds. So some people might have just an hour to do everything Mm. and they're targeted on how many products they sell from that thing that they're doing. Or you might have someone who has a whole day with a client and does a whole suite of other things, including nutrition and breathing and everything else. Um, or you might have someone who is also themselves a professional athlete and a physiotherapist and um, trying to get sponsorship at the same time as having a full calendar of clients coming <laughs> yeah. through. Um, and then you might have someone who had a job that they didn't like in IT. They really liked cycling. They decided to retrain. And now they've got a toolbox in the back of their van and they drive around people's houses. <laughs> and it's beautiful. It is a really beautiful place to be to see like the whole of humanity represented (laughs) within this this (laughs) tiny little um niche of bike fitting so when it comes to time i think it comes back to you know people have chosen those business models after coming to a decision for themselves and so they've already thought about what's important to them what their values are um but they might have ended up in a shop or a situation that they've got no control over So their attitudes to time and what they can or can't or should or shouldn't do in a bike fit are also very environmentally dependent. Um, But one of the one of the kind of client bike fitter things that comes up around time is that expectation for the client of how long will this take? How Mm. deep will this go? Mm. What will happen during the bike? Mm. That's one of the things when we do a six week contact point course is. um, looking at those expectations for yourself and then how do you communicate it to the client in a way that's understandable for them so Mm. if you're just going in for one hour and you're going to sell them three products you tell them that and then they don't get that icky feeling where oh this person made me buy this thing i didn't want to Mm. yeah um equally if it's going to take six hours and they think they're going to be in and out in half an hour um you're going to be getting bad feedback that you were wasting people's time um Mm. so there's kind of understanding your own your own relationship to time understanding that people are giving up their time to come to you and then from that working out so for your example of it it took it takes two hours for someone to remember that they've had a broken (laughs) a broken neck and that's why they can't look to the left I mean that's not a joke either like stuff like that happened um so how do we get it so that it doesn't need to take two hours if that's the depth that you want to work. So then you can look at things like pre-fit questionnaires, um, kind of self-reflection sheets for the client, or just simply a heads up, like if you know, if you don't disclose these kind of things, we'll only be able to work to a certain limit. Or yeah. there's yeah. so many different um different environments. And the cultural things is quite interesting as well. Like me being able to talk about lady parts and not being able to wee. 
Um, I can sit and talk about that quite happily in my bedroom in England, but there'll be other parts of the world where that is not okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it is um, it is amazing, like, um, all the difference. Well, just the, the variety of the human race. <laughs> and, uh, you know, even um, I recently went to Eurobike and uh, that was a really nice opportunity to meet a lot of different uh, bike fitters from around the world who I'd never spoken to before and just chat shop about, you know, their practice and what they find um, valuable, uh, how do they go about business. And, and it's, it's so interesting how different everybody is. Um, in how they approach their way of working. So, you know, some people kind of not book someone in until they've had a phone conversation with them. And so, you know, they'll go through an initial uh, kind of screening, as it were. Are you the right kind of rider to be coming to see me? Um, Other people just work within shops and they're bounded by, you know, what the shop wants them to do as a bike fitter and it's the fitting is simply a tool to sell a bike rather than kind of solve kind of issues and so on and so they're they're they're, com- they're very much out of control of kind of how they choose their clients and so on so still can call the well it's still called bike fitting whether or not you screen someone or you kind of have clients just fall into your lap um but they're completely different experiences mm. altogether What did you notice in in getting to talk to those people? Um, There was a, uh, there was a real community around, you know, we're here to help people and to um, make riders feel better and and create that kind of great ride, ride feel. Um, And I guess most practitioners seem to have been through the struggle themselves. And so that's why they want to help other people. They're, they've been through it. And so they have that kind of knowledge and experience to share. Um, but how they go about it is completely different. It's, it's wildly different. Um, but there is a, um, yeah, a shared kind of practitioner kind of um, a desire to help people at the, at the, you know, at the core of everything. Um, and you know whether you're working with professional athletes or kind of amateurs who are you know commuting by e-bike, you know they they require very different kind of approaches and different kinds of people who enjoy different things. Um, but yeah, even like speaking to I think next week there's a I've got an interview with an Israeli bike fitter um, from the show, and you know even for someone i i didn't even know that cycling was a big thing in israel but supposedly it's it's like you know massive and they love it out there um but the key kind of like concepts and issues that people come into are very similar as well yeah and and so the fitters it's very easy to kind of talk to other fitters because they all share similar kind of issues or they see just similar kind of problems every day you know i guess um you know, it's, at the end of the day, you're just working with human beings and human beings have, you know, similar kind of issues. Yeah, I'm, I'm smiling because when you're talking there, um, the, the psychology that the stuff I do um, is based on Adlerian psychology. And it works on the premise of the fundamental human needs to belong and to have significance, to be able to contribute. Mm. And that's, um, as you were talking, I was really hearing that from your impression within the bike fit community, that belonging to the group and that desire to contribute mm. to it by giving back what you've learned and then sharing um cooperatively that information mm. um and that that belonging together uh it's something that i've noticed as well um and one of the reasons why i keep doing this is that i really love it that there's a whole bunch of people doing this stuff that doesn't really need to be done i mean it does, yeah, yeah. in the grand yeah. scheme of things pl- planting a field of wheat or raising a cow might be more important yeah. but, but we find such um, fulfillment and such connection and uh, such wonderful relationships through it we've had a couple of people mm. from israel come and train with us um mm. which uh which again was i open there was one guy he'd uh shout shout out to you you know who you are if you're listening um he had had a heart attack He'd been in a different industry, had had a heart attack, um, woken up at the side of the road and decided he was going to do something that he liked with the rest of his life. 
Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and so he came to train with us in Bath. And oh, wow. uh, it was really interesting because even though he'd wanted, he's a cyclist, he loved it, and his desire was to do something that he liked, he still had a very business-minded head on him. And he was making sure that everything that he was doing was scalable or that um, it had some sort of uh, return for investment with the products and stuff as well. And uh, that's one of the that's one of the areas that um, like the physiotherapists and the people coming from um, maybe mechanic backgrounds, that kind of thing, don't necessarily have that business mindset mm. on them as well. And mm. so it was great to sit down with him and go, well, look, this is, why are you doing that? That takes this time. You make this much money, whereas you could do this one, which is much more scalable, and make that much money. It's like, oh, I didn't even see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. awesome. And I, we asked him, um, Tony got into making hummus at that time. And so we asked him for his favourite hummus recipe, knowing that the Middle East was a great place for hummus. Mm. And uh, he said, we just buy it from the shop. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. There you go. Sometimes, uh, well, I don't know if Tesco's hummus is going <laughs> to cut the mustard. But yeah. But yeah, oh, that's uh, yeah, it's been a, a really good conversation, Gillian. Thank you so much for uh, sharing all of that. But uh, I think we're coming up to an hour, so I think that might be time to kind of wrap it up. Lots and lots of different things uh, to think about there. Um, lots of um, thoughts around values, um, around needs, uh, what really matters, um, how we approach kind of our practice of sport and practicing as uh, bike fitters so a little bit of everything for if you're an aspiring bike fitter to an experienced bike fitter or you're just someone who's interested in bike fitting and uh, interested in the sport of cycling but yeah there's definitely some um knowing yourself i think is uh, a key kind of value of this podcast so far which i've taken away and uh, just taking that time to kind of understand yourself and maybe see yourself from a different perspective and that can be really, really valuable in uh, in furthering your yourself and your practice and uh, how we go about it. And um, yeah, if you can make some hummus. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Ray. It's been wonderful chatting with you. Thank you to everyone who stayed listening to the end. Yeah, thanks, guys. And uh, if we want to find you, Gillian, how do we find you on the great wide web? Uh, yeah, you can find us at talkcycling.com, T O R K E C Y C L I N G dot com. And my personal website is gcpdtrainer.co.uk. Mm, what's that stand for? Um, Gillian Cork Positive Discipline Trainer. Oh, there we go. So um uh are you any on any socials or anything like that or? uh we're sort of yeah we're on that we don't really do much we're definitely gen x who have yeah mixed <laughs> our saturation with how many things we can click and like and share um so we do have things but they're not uh they're not very active yeah i'll, I'll link to some if i can but uh yeah better to go and see you in person exactly. um so if you're in bath go and see, go and see jillian <laughs> she's lovely and uh, yeah, hopefully um, we'll get your uh, get you again on the podcast at some point. I'm sure as we uh, find more things to talk about. And uh, yeah, all the best to Tony as well. Thank you, much appreciated. All right, cool. Catch you later. Suffering from numb hands, tingling toes, and any other persistent discomforts when you ride, these are all signs that your bike fit could be improved. If you're bike fit curious, get in touch with Way or Matt by emailing info at foundation.fit or finding them on Instagram at FDN underscore bike fit. Finally, for all your bike servicing needs, custom dream bike or hand-built wheels, go to www.frequencycycleworks.com or find me on Instagram at frequencycycleworks. Until next time, keep on spinning.